Magic 87.6. Let's talk some tech with Matthew Dickerson. Yay, let's talk oh. some tech. Yes, let's do it. Now, the, the big tech story is, I know people are probably over it by now, but a billionaire went into space, Matt. What did he do? <laughs> well, it's probably a pretty big deal for the rest of society because once a billionaire goes into space, then eventually you and I might go into space. It'd probably be a few years before it's cheap enough that it's down to our level, but it's something that it's a pretty, pretty big deal. Richard Branson, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, they've got nothing better to do with their billions and billions of money except burn it up trying to be the first one into space. And the winner was Richard Branson, which, as you say, it may well be known by people already. There's been a bit of news on it. But Jeff yeah. Bezos had come out in a very strong statement and said he was going to be the first one because he was going to go up there on the 20th of July. And Branson said, oh, right, I see that challenge being issued to me and I'm going to go one better. Having said that, I actually think it's quite fair that Branson was the first one up there because he started back in 2004. He thought this was a good idea. And his concept was to take a smaller plane up on a larger plane hanging underneath it when it got to a certain height, release the smaller plane, and off it goes to get to space. And I'll come to that in a moment. There's a bit of debate about whether they actually went into space or not. But I thought that was quite fair that he was there because he was there first. Back in about 2014, there were a few minor hiccups, you know, a crash, someone died. So there were some people walking off the job. And I think Branson, for a little while, kind of gave up on the idea until Bezos and Musk came along and said, we're going to take man into space and have space tourism. And Branson said, hold on, that's my idea. I better get back on the ball here. And so went then and started to try and get into there. He went up to 80 kilometres above the Earth. Now, in the US... 80 kilometres is defined as being into space. There are some experts who say that you don't get into space until you get to 100 kilometres. So maybe a little bit of debate about whether he was the first into space. Maybe Bezos or Musk will go to 100 kilometres and then say, well, we were the first ones to go into space. Really, yours didn't really count, Branson. So there might be a little bit more to go on this. But it's certainly something that we'll see more and more. Tourists are going to go up there. Branson, for example, has... 600 reservations to go into space on his aircraft, 600 people. They don't know how much it will be. They think it will be around about half a million dollars or more, and they've got 600 reservations. There is a market there for this sort of stuff. Again, takes a little while before it gets down to our price level, but this is something that's going to keep happening, and these three companies are going to be out there leading the way. Yeah. Considering I read a story the other day, Matt, that said a ticket on a Qantas airline flight now costs $70,000. You know what? You weigh it up, it's... it's <laughs> <laughs> You're right. It's probably getting that stage where it mightn't be much dearer yeah. than a normal Qantas flight. Oh, yeah. No, abs absolutely. Um, now, here's an interesting one. Uh, as a man, and I'll come out and say this, there is some times where you have some serious poo talk. And you've probably done it at some stage as well, haven't you, Matt? I'm saying nothing, and the basis that might incriminate myself. Yeah. <laughs> Look, we all get childish with our mates sometimes, but I haven't actually sat there and thought how much power is in poo. No. That's a new angle. For all the poo talks that people may or may not have had, talking about converting poo to power is not one of those talks that I think people have had. But in South Korea... Not only have they had talks about that, but they've now got a toilet that turns excrement into power. This is unbelievable. And it gets better. It can also turn it into a digital currency. So when you go and use oh. a certain – that's right. We'll get there. We'll get there. When you use a certain toilet at – or a particular university, the Yusun National Institute of Science and Technology – they've got a toilet there that takes the waste products, the, the feces out of your waste – and takes it through to a certain component of the building, turns it into methane, then burns that methane to produce hot water or power. And I've never actually thought about the potential of poo power, but apparently we defecate about half a kilogram a day, and that's enough to produce about 0.5 kilowatt hours. Or if you want to convert that into something a bit more real, that'll drive your car for about 1.2 kilometres. So a poo a day gets you to drive a car 1.2 kilometres. It doesn't sound like much, but when you combine 
all the poo from all the students and people at this particular university, this one building, it's enough to actually create a fair amount of power. If you use this power, or use this toilet, sorry, and convert your poo to power, you actually get rewarded with a digital currency called Jigul. Now, Jigul is South Korean for honey. I'm not sure about the linkage there with honey and poo. Don't even go there. But you get 10 Jigul a day, and that's enough for you to go and buy a coffee or a bit of fruit or maybe a book. So you can actually go and use this toilet and convert it into coffee. This is sounding quite incredible. Yeah, well, if you convert the coffee, it's kind of like the never-ending circle in a way because it coffee is. then creates extra excrement and then, you know, it's kind of like the circle around. You know what, mate? You might think driving 1.2 kilometers isn't very far, but seriously, that'll get me from my house into the center of Mudgee every day. There you go. So you just need a toilet that converts your poo to power to convert to electricity to go into your car to drive into town. Then you're stuck. You've got to get back home. Oh, well, that's all right. If you see what comes out of my body, I would definitely get back home. It is not a pretty sight. <laughs> Thank you. I know that's a mental image that most people don't want at that's this right. time Thank of the you. morning. But... <laughs> i just got to try and burn that out of my memory now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Uh, now, parents have a uh, hard time at the moment with their kids if they're gamers, but don't tell me there's now a gaming company that's taking some responsibility over curfews and stuff, man. Well, it is. It's a bit of a shame really that parents can't enforce the curfew on their kids and I'm not talking about a curfew I'm going to the pub mum and dad please be home by midnight I'm talking about a much bigger problem across the world and in particular in China where gaming addiction is becoming a major issue to the point where now it's not just a recommendation by the government it's not something they're saying you should just cut back how much your kids are playing it's now illegal it's against the law for kids minors to play games past 10 p.m. So this is quite wow. incredible. Now, what kids do, of course, being kids, is they always try and work out ways to get around this sort of stuff. So they've been using their parents' accounts and logging on and using that. Now their parents are onto the kids. So now they're finding there's this whole group of kids in China that are visiting their grandparents. Hi, <laughs> Grandpa, Grandma, how are you going? Hey, let me show you this new game I've been playing. Oh, wait up. We just need to create an account for you. So they're creating an account with their grandparents' details. So then when they go back home, they can keep playing the game. And obviously, the game thinks that there's someone that's 85 years of age playing. And they're going, wow, this person's pretty impressive at 85. So Tencent, which is the biggest gaming company in the world, they've got titles like League of Legends and Fortnite. They've now got facial recognition software. So if people are playing the game past 10 p.m., if people are spending money on the game, if they're playing the game for extended periods of time, they actually use the facial recognition or the camera on the whatever you're using, the console that you're using or the computer you're using, and they actually look at the person and make sure that matches up with the image of the person that's got that account registered. Kids will try and work out another way around that. They'll put a photo there in front of it. They'll wear a face mask of their grandpa when they're playing. But again, they say the facial recognition software is good enough that it will actually pick this up. So the, the rules in China are minors can't play games between 10 p.m. and 8 a.m. And they can't play for more than 90 minutes on a weekday. So pretty strict rules. I reckon there'd be some Aussie kids who'd be really suffering if those were the rules over here. Oh, but my nephew, seriously, he, he would have the itches if he only got 90 minutes of game time. Both my nephews, actually, he, my wife's nephews, dead said, I, I remember, you, you know, when he used to live with us, one of them, he was 20 years old, Matt, and I would get up to do breakfast radio and he would still be playing all night. <laughs> It's like, mate, what are you doing? Oh, I'm competing in a tournament in Germany. I'm like, do you realize it's quarter to five in the morning, mate? <laughs> you haven't slept. Oh, yeah, but I'm competing with Hans in Germany. I'm like, I don't care about Hans in Germany, mate. I don't think he'd be Robinson Crusoe either. No, no, no. He wouldn't survive five minutes if he didn't have uh, that game time. But uh, cyber attacks, they are a thing in the modern world. And uh, don't tell me the New South Wales government got hit again, mate. Yeah, they've had a couple of hits lately. They've had Service New South Wales was hit last year. And now the Department of Education. Now, we know that these cyber attackers typically aren't state players. They're not making political statements. They're not trying to change the world. 
They just want to make money. So what they're typically doing is attacking organisations that have got money to pay. We've seen Colonial Pipeline in the US, for example. We saw a meat produced from the US. And so now we're seeing the Department of Education. The timing was absolutely perfect when the lockdowns were announced. And so when kids at schools in Sydney weren't allowed to go back to school, teachers had to suddenly start preparing for online delivery of classes. They couldn't do that because suddenly they couldn't access their emails, they couldn't access all their information from their school networks. So perfect timing. Now we don't know, we don't have any details about any ransom demands, anything that they're actually asking from the Department of Education. All we know, it's been very difficult for teachers over the last few days trying to prepare for online delivery of classes. Out here in regional areas, obviously, kids are allowed to go back to school with certain conditions with masks, that type of thing, but it still impacted teachers out here as well, just not being able to access your email. Again, think about that. Not being able to access your email for five minutes would be enough to send some people into heart palpitations, cold sweats. So taking away email and other online tools from teachers would be pretty difficult for them to keep doing their job properly. This is going to be an ongoing problem. We see vaccines for real viruses in the real world. We need to come up with some sort of vaccine for the online world. I don't have a solution there, but this is a sort of problem we have ongoing at the moment, Andrew. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, this is interesting, Matt. Uh, the Goodwood Festival is uh, happening, and they had an interesting car bank its debut. An interesting car indeed. Sometimes they get people that design a whole range of different things and bring them into the car world. So Thomas Heatherwick, you might have heard of him. He's designed some buses in the UK, but probably more or more well known for designing Google's head office. So more in the physical space of a building that he's been renowned for. But he's been asked to design a car that's a modern interpretation of a car. So he's done two quite interesting things. He's identified pollution is a problem and cars pollution is a real issue around the world. So this particular car is an electric car, as you can imagine, for a modern car, but it actually filters air. As you're driving along, it's taking air through the front. It doesn't need to go through a radiator because it's not using a normal petrol engine car or petrol engine in it. So it takes air through the front, filters that air, and they talk about the fact that they will filter particulates out of the air, the equivalent of a tennis ball size over a year. So not a lot, but you can imagine if you had lots of these cars on the road and they're all filtering out a tennis ball size of particulates over a year, that starts to add up. The other part is that they've built this car not just to be a car that you get in and drive from A to B. Cars are typically used for less than 10% of the time actually driving. 90% of the time or more is what this particular designer caught up on is the car just sits there doing nothing. So he's designed this car to be a livable space. And I'm talking about a Winnebago, a caravan. This is a normal car, but the, the seats will turn around. The car will turn into a living space. The seats will even turn into beds. So you could live in this wow. car if you wanted to. And there are some people, I've seen people living in cars, people that may be a bit tough for somewhere to live or maybe just tough to get into the rental space. So buying a car that's your transport, that cleans the air as you drive, and then the car that you sleep in at night, this might be part of the way to solving some of the homeless issues we've got around the world. And it's a different approach. I'm not necessarily saying this is going to take off dramatically tomorrow, but it is certainly a different approach because we know there are homeless people and we know cars are sitting there with one billion of them in the world, not used most of the time. A different approach.